The next anatomic region that we're going to discuss is the cerebellopontine angle. There are three main diagnoses that relate to the cerebellopontine angle cistern, a vestibular schwannoma, a meningioma, and an epidermoid cyst. There are a variety of less likely lesions like arachnoid cysts, lipomas, vascular lesions, choroid plexus tumor, and endolymphatic sac tumor that we'll also discuss more briefly. Usually when you encounter an enhancing mass in the cerebellopontine angle cistern, you're trying to distinguish between a vestibular schwannoma versus a meningioma. And usually when it's a cystic lesion, you're trying to distinguish between an epidermoid and an arachnoid cyst, so we'll talk about those pairs. How can we tell the difference between an acoustic neuroma and a meningioma? These are both enhancing masses that occupy the cerebellopontine angle cistern. So what are the differentiating features? If the mass is centered at the porous acousticus, then it is more likely to be an acoustic neuroma because it's right along the course of the nerve. If it is broad-based against the underlying bone, then that's more likely to be a meningioma. If there is a dural tail, obviously we associate dural tails with meningiomas. If the mass widens the bony margins of the porous acousticus with slow remodeling, that's more likely to be an acoustic neuroma. If it knuckles into or enters the IAC or is uh, predominantly within the internal auditory canal, that's more likely to be an acoustic neuroma. If it calcifies, that's more likely to be a meningioma. Neither of these lesions calcifies frequently, but of the two, meningioma is the one that can calcify. Now, vestibular schwannomas essentially never calcify. If you see cystic degeneration, that's characteristic of acoustic neuromas, vestibular schwannomas. Um, any lesion that is over one centimeter in diameter is likely to have some degree of heterogeneity in the enhancement. Not all of this is true cyst formation. Some of this is just a, difference, a different um, uh, uh, histopathologic features, um, but it looks cystic and, it, um, and it's non-enhancing. That's more likely to be uh, the acoustic neuroma. Here is a classic example of a vestibular schwannoma. You'll notice that I'm going back and forth between the terms vestibular schwannoma and acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma is an outdated term. Vestibular schwannoma, much more precise and accurate, but you'll find that people still use the term acoustic neuroma, and I think it's reasonable to consider them synonyms. So what are the features here that let us know that this is a vestibular schwannoma? Look how it extends deep into the internal auditory canal, completely filling the internal uh, auditory canal all the way from the porous acousticus down to the fundus. And if you look at that porous acousticus and compare it to its counterpart, you can see that it sure has been widened by this mass. Let's look at the heterogeneity of enhancement, non-enhancing scattered areas throughout the mass, much more consistent with an acoustic neuroma. How about uh, the relationship to the underlying bone? Notice that this mass makes acute angles with the underlying bone. It is not broad-based. The portion of the tumor that attaches to the bone is not the widest part of the tumor. That's what we mean by broad-based. This has an acute angle with the underlying bone. That is, in my opinion, the most important sign that you are dealing with a vestibular schwannoma. Compare that last slide to this one. This is a classic meningioma of the cerebellopontine angle. Notice how the widest part of the tumor is the part that is up against the bone. That's what we mean by a broad-based lesion. Look at this piece of enhancement extending along the dura of the clivus. That's what we mean by a dural tail. In fact, you can almost imagine this looking like a little mouse with a tail. That's the dural tail that we're looking for in meningioma. The enhancement pattern here is not perfectly uniform. There are a couple of little dots of lesser or greater enhancement. That degree of heterogeneity, I mean, as, as masses in the brain go, this is a pretty homogeneous enhancement pattern. So we'll call that homogeneous. Now the tricky thing here is what about this enhancement in the internal auditory canal? At first glance, it looks like this tumor is just sort of covering uh, 
the porous acousticus, but why is there all this enhancement in here? The answer is that this is neuritis. The nerves that have been crushed as they try to get around this meningioma are irritated and enhancing, so that's why we're seeing the uh, enhancement along those nerves. Now, meningioma can turn the corner and enter into the internal auditory canal. It's not impossible. All of these features are just guidelines. What do you do when you run into a mass that has both types of features? How about this one? This mass goes into the internal auditory canal. It's widening the porous acousticus and it's, it's kind of heterogeneous, but not that much. So there's some features that say acoustic neuroma, but then look how broad based it is. The widest part of the tumor is definitely the part that's up against the bone. So it's only, it's, it's more or less homogeneous. It's got a broad base. Is this gonna be a vestibular schwannoma or a meningioma? When you run into situations like this, you have to look at all the different features and sort of average them out in your mind and decide which of the features is, uh, yeah, how it adds up, sum it up in your head. In my mind, this has more features of acoustic neuroma, the extent into the IC really telling in this case for me. So that's a vestibular schwannoma. So here's a case where we have a mass that is widening the porous acousticus and extending deep into the IAC. That is very much like a, uh, a schwannoma, but it's very broad based, right? Maybe a 90 degree uh, uh, angle on this side and um, a little less than 90 degrees over here, an acute angle over there, but very uniformly enhancing. And look how it is up against the bone and turning the corner as it enters the porous acousticus. Those are characteristics that are more like a meningioma. So even though there are some features that say schwannoma and some features that say meningioma here, overall, this is more like a meningioma. So we're going to call it a meningioma. Here's a situation where we have a mass that's centered on the uh, porous acousticus, widening the porous acousticus, knuckling a little bit into the IAC, um, and it's got uh, more or less homogeneous, some heterogeneity to it. Notice how on this side, it makes a sharp angle, an acute angle with the underlying bone, and over here, an obtuse angle with the underlying bone. Well, now you've got uh, uh, two conflicting sets of findings here. But overall, this is the trustworthy angle, that knuckle in there, taking it all together, this looks a lot more like a vestibular schwannoma. So you end up looking at the different features and balancing them all out in your mind. Be a little bit careful when you're dealing with this broad based against the underlying bone scenario. There is no way you could think that this is broad based. This thing is floating out in the cerebellopontian angle cistern. It's not even touching the bone. So you might be in, uh, inclined to call this a vestibular schwannoma, but look how uniform that enhancement is. That is perfectly uniform. Uh, and so that should raise some questions in our mind. It turns out that meningiomas can arise from ependymal surfaces. You're familiar with this because meningiomas are the most common intraventricular tumor. So you know that meningiomas don't need to arise off underlying bone. And that's the case in this particular example. This happens to be a meningioma of the cerebellopontine angle cistern despite its spherical configuration. It's that uniform enhancement that is the biggest clue. Hopefully we all know what this is. There are bilateral uh, vestibular schwannomas here. And uh, even if you didn't have all of the other schwannomas and meningiomas, uh, like uh, along the fifth cranial nerves here, you can see spreading forward along V2, uh, et cetera. Even if you didn't have all these others to clue you in that this is a systemic problem, the presence of two vestibular schwannomas, bilateral vestibular schwannomas, that in and of itself is sufficient to establish a diagnosis of neurofibromatosis type 2. Notice how uniformly this uh, vestibular schwannoma is enhancing. Sometimes they don't get cystic. At first glance, you might look at this lesion and say to yourself, that is classic 
for a schwannoma. It has a, uh, a spherical configuration. It's got that heterogeneous enhancement. Uh, it's expanding stuff around the petrous apex. It looks just like a schwannoma, and it is a schwannoma. It's just in the wrong place, right? It should be here, centered on the porous acousticus. Instead, it's anterior. Where exactly is it? Well, let's look at the normal Meckel's cave on the right side, and then let's look at the Meckel's cave on the left side. Look how it is expanded, draped over the top of this lesion. This lesion is remodeling Meckel's cave because it is actually a schwannoma of the fifth cranial nerve. So if you see a mass that looks just like a vestibular schwannoma, except it's along the course of the trigeminal nerve, it probably is a schwannoma. It's a trigeminal schwannoma. This lesion looks very much like the trigeminal schwannoma that I just showed you. You can see the enhancement in Meckel's cave along V2 here. It's gotten all the way out to the pterygopalatine fossa, and you can see it extending back along the expected course of the uh, trunk of the fifth cranial nerve, and it's got some non-enhancing and some enhancing areas. Be careful, this is not a schwannoma at all. This is perineural spread from squamous cell carcinoma that has come up through the pterygopalatine fossa, come back along V2, filled Michael's cave, and then spread back along the trunk of the fifth cranial nerve. And this is all perineural spread of squamous cell carcinoma extending back to the brain stem along the fifth cranial nerve. Here's another important mimic. At first glance, you might look at this and say, ah, oh, this is gonna be a meningioma. It's uniformly enhancing. It's broad based against the bone of the petrous apex. I can even see a dural tail coming back. So meningioma next case. But there's a lot more going on here. And this mass is really destructive. You can see that the normal petrous apex, this normal triangle of bone of the petrous apex has been invaded, destroyed, and there's really a lot of tumor spread into surrounding structures. If you're really observant, you might see the very bottom of a, uh, of a parenchymal lesion in the cerebellum. These are metastases, and that's, that's a bony metastasis to the petrous apex that has grown out into the cerebellopontine angle cistern, an important mimic. Let's turn our attention now to the differential diagnosis of epidermoid and arachnoid cyst. So how do these two lesions that sound so different, an epidermoid tumor and an arachnoid cyst, how do they end up on the same differential diagnosis? The reason is that on conventional MR sequences and on CT, they look the same. They have the same T1 and T2 signal, which is bright on T2 and relatively low on T1. Thankfully, uh, our other sequences will differentiate them. Um, they, uh, an epidermoid does not suppress on flare. Uh, on DWI, epidermoids restrict diffusion, and you can see differences uh, uh, on proton density and on steady state free procession sequences, which most people call KISS or Fiesta. Uh, to differentiate epidermoid tumors from arachnoid cysts. If you're having trouble remembering which one is the bright one and which one is the dark one on each of these sequences, just remember that arachnoid cysts always follow CSF. They always follow CSF. So they suppress on flare, they have facilitated diffusion, they're low signal on proton density, and they're extremely bright on steady state free precession. Another feature that might help you out is that arachnoid cysts have very smooth margins. They tend to be ovoid or spherical, whereas epidermoids are much more infiltrative. They send out little projections along all of the ependymal surfaces. They'll crawl through uh, the foramen of Magendi or Lushka, uh, and, and they'll intercalate into the folia of the, uh, of the cerebellum. So that can be another clue for you. Here is a classic example of a cerebellopontine angle cistern mass that belongs in the differential of epidermoid versus arachnoid cyst. You can see that it is the same color as CSF on T1 weighted images. It is the same color as CSF on T2 weighted images. How are we gonna tell these apart? We're gonna look at other sequences. Uh, 
but there might be a clue if you look at the margins. Look how irregular, lobulated the margins are here. That smells a little bit more like an epidermoid. Let's double check. Here's a flare sequence. You can see that the lesion fails to suppress on flare and is in fact heterogeneously bright. That's consistent with an epidermoid tumor. And here's the clincher, the diffusion weighted image, restricted diffusion. An arachnoid cyst should have facilitated diffusion. This restricted diffusion is a strong indication that we're dealing with an epidermoid tumor. Be careful, not every epidermoid tumor will restrict diffusion. It's not perfectly sensitive but it's a pretty good sign. Here's another example of a mass, a cystic mass in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. Uh, here it is dark on T1 matching CSF, bright on T2 matching CSF. And this time when we pull up the diffusion weighted images, there is facilitated diffusion, dark signal. That lets us know that this is an arachnoid cyst in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. Um, maybe the smooth ovoid configuration, nice well-defined margins, maybe that was another clue for us as well. Another example in the differential of epidermoid tumor and arachnoid cyst, here is a lesion that has a well-defined margin. It is bright on T2, same as CSF. It's in the cerebral pontine angle cistern, displacing the cerebellum and the brainstem. Um, well marginated, nicely defined rim. That's a clue, maybe. But the diffusion weighted image is going to really clinch it for us. Facilitated diffusion. There's another arachnoid cyst. Steady state free procession sequences are a great way to look for the extent of epidermoid tumors and after surgery to look for residual or recurrent disease because epidermoids are not nearly as bright as CSF on this particular sequence. T2s, this will look just like that, but on uh, SSFP, you can really make out every little lobulation of the tumor and distinguish it from the underlying CSF. Very powerful tool, um, and we always use, uh, well, I'm a GE shop, so we call them Fiesta. We always use Fiesta when we're looking uh, for residual or recurrent epidermoid tumors, or when we are preparing for surgery and we want to map out the extent of these tumors. Remember, they can intercalate, they can extend through the foramen of Lushka, find their way into the fourth ventricle. It can be very tricky to get the whole tumor out, and so it's really useful to have mapped it out ahead of time for the surgeon. Lipomas in the cerebellar pontine angle are really tricky. When you look at this image, this is a post-contrast image, and there is a big bright mass sitting in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. It's just as bright as the enhancing basilar artery right there. It is really inviting to say, wow, uniformly enhancing mass, probably a vestibular schwannoma. It's so small, it just hasn't gotten cystic, or not, and there's no non-enhancing heterogeneous components to it, but it's still most likely. Be careful. If you don't fat suppress, your post-contrast imaging, this is a pitfall. Here's that exact same cut with the fat suppressed and this whole lesion suppresses right out. It is composed of fat. It is a lipoma of the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. The key here is comparing a image with fat suppression and an image without fat suppression and that will clue you in that you're dealing with a lipoma. Don't fall for interpreting just this one image and assuming that that is enhancement when it's really intrinsic bright T1 signal. There's a variety of vascular loops that can mimic masses in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. At first glance, this looks like a vestibular schwannoma. Maybe you think it's a meningioma because there's a dural tail coming off, but what you're actually looking at here is a dolicolectasia of the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery is swinging up, enlarged, looping up into the cerebellar pontine angle cistern, right over top of the porous acousticus, occluding the porous. Uh, 
and displacing the seventh and eighth cranial nerves. But uh, it's a lot easier when you see a stack of images and you can follow the vessel up, but uh, don't jump to conclusions based on a single image like this one. That's dolichoectasia of the vertebral artery. Here's another example of a vascular loop that can affect the internal auditory canal. At first glance, you have a dural lining, enhancing dura, lining the inside of the IC. Maybe this is a thin meningioma, um, or maybe this is some sort of leptomeningeal enhancement, carcinomatosis, something like that. This is a normal bit of anatomy. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery often loops into the internal auditory canal crossing the porous acousticus. In fact, 30% of patients have an ICA loop that extends into the internal auditory canal. Some people believe that the, a loop of ICA into the internal auditory canal can induce tinnitus. It's, uh, it's a questionable diagnosis. Usually, you can just follow the loop of ICA. This, I, I chose this case specifically because it shows the, uh, the ICA loop all the way deep, lining the walls of the internal auditory canal. This is uncharacteristic for it to go so deep and, and line the walls like that. Um, but if you trace this back, you can figure out that it is the ICA based on its origin off of the basilar artery. So why does the ICA do this? Why does the ICA go deep into the internal auditory canal. Well, it turns out that the cochlear artery is a branch of ICA, and sometimes the cochlear artery is very short, and ICA needs to go all the way out there and, 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 and deliver it to, um, to the cochlea. Sometimes the cochlear artery is much longer, and ICA can stay out in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern and not go through the porous acousticus at all. Here is a worrisome hyperdense mass in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. It's very rounded. It doesn't have a broad base. Um, maybe this is a vestibular schwannoma, but there's a trick here. This is an unenhanced scan. So why would a vestibular schwannoma be so dense? We've talked about the fact that they don't actually calcify. Here it is on a T2-weighted sequence, very dark for any of the things we're talking about, very dark, and maybe even a lamellar pattern around the outside, some heterogeneous, centrally, uh, some heterogeneous signal cent centrally, and you can see that there's a lamellar pattern on the outside. Figured it out yet? How about a gradient sequence that shows this dark signal blossoming around the outside? This is clot, and what is the clot doing here? This is an aneurysm. This happens to be an aneurysm of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Obviously, an ICA aneurysm could appear in the exact same location. So aneurysm, a thrombosed aneurysm, that's why it's so dense on CT, a thrombosed aneurysm mimicking a mass of the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. I suppose officially it is a mass, but it's a vascular mass. At first glance, this lesion looks a lot like that lipoma from a few slides ago. It's rounded, a little bit lobular in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. I will tell you though that this is the true enhancement and not just intrinsic T1 signal. So what other lesion might be sitting out there? Well, if you look at a corresponding CT angiogram, you can see the classic Medusa head appearance of a developmental venous anomaly. Let's follow that out. And you can see it extending out into the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. That's its drainage of the DVA. And here, once it gets out, that abnormal flow forms a venous varix. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at a venous varix mimicking a tumor mass in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern. You're probably wondering, how can you get a choroid plexus papilloma out in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern? There's no choroid plexus there. The choroid plexus normally lives in the atria, the lateral ventricles, and it extends forward a bit into the temporal horns. And it exists in the fourth ventricle, 
but that's it. Well, it turns out that as we age, our fourth ventricular choroid plexus will sometimes intercalate out, extend out through the foramen of Lushka, that's from the fourth ventricle out through the foramen of Lushka and into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. Those little tails of choroid plexus sticking out there will sometimes form tumors. And that's how you end up with a choroid plexus papilloma in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. The classic appearance is a mixed solid and cystic lesion. You can see a large cystic component and a rounded solid component. Characteristic, characteristic appearance for a choroid plexus papilloma, kind of a weird location. And then endolymphatic sac tumors. Um, these are sort of in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. and they're really along the posterior wall of the porous acousticus. You can see right where the vestibular aqueduct emerges out into the posterior fossa. That's where the endolymphatic sac lives, and that's where tumors of the endolymphatic sac arise. Right? These almost exclusively occur in the setting of von Hippel-Lindau disease, but you do occasionally see sporadic endolymphatic sac tumors. They are characterized by a very aggressive, angry appearance um, with a lot of erosion of the underlying bone. They're very heterogeneous on MRI. Here's an example of that aggressive appearance on MRI. In addition to this component of tumor that is sitting in the uh, posterior fossa and into the cerebellopontine angle cistern, you can see a lot of erosion into the underlying petrous bone, and you can see extension through the internal auditory canal, and it's even invaded into the labyrinth. You can see that there's enhancement in the basal turn of the cochlea. Endolymphatic sac tumor is really characterized by their severe aggressivity. And with that, we will conclude our review of the cerebellopontine angle.